Good afternoon. My name is William Tate. I'm chair of this session and president of the American Education Research Association for two more days, I believe. <clears throat> it is my great pleasure to introduce this year's Wallace Foundation Distinguished Lecturer. Our distinguished lecturer is a former secondary English teacher. Thus, it seems appropriate to borrow a line from Phyllis Wheatley, and specifically a poem, to inform this introduction. Wheatley wrote, Imagination, who can sing thy force? Imagination, who can sing thy force? Imagination, who can sing thy force? Imagine developing a theory of cultural modeling to support in advanced learning with traditionally underserved students. She did. Imagine signifying as a scaffold to advance literary interpretation. She did. Imagine producing research and scholarly writings while finding, founding a school and offering numerous professional development to educators across the world. She did. Imagine supporting the advancement of research as Vice President of Division G and as President of the National Conference on Research in Language and Literacy. She did. Imagine accepting the nomination to run for the presidency of the American Educational Research Association and winning. She did. <clears throat> Imagination. Who can sing thy force? Ladies and gentlemen, a woman of imagination and intellect, Professor Carol Lee, this year's Wallace Foundation Distinguished Lecturer. I want to thank uh, William Tate uh, for this uh, invitation. Uh, he's also the one that got me to run for that election, too. <laughs> so I want to first um, uh, ask your indulgence because I'm going to read this speech. Uh, so that I can get everything in that I want to say. Um, the, uh would like to dedicate this session to the memory of Asa Grant Hilliard III, who was an, out, was and is an outstanding human being, educator, researcher, institution builder, who very much inspired all of my thinking and activities for a very long time. I'd also like to give special thanks to uh, Joyce King from Georgia State University, Douglas Medin from Northwestern, Chris Gutierrez from UCLA, Margaret Beale Spencer from the University of Pennsylvania, Arnetha Ball, and uh, the child group uh, that's here who have very much um, um, gave me tremendous feedback on this, uh, on this presentation. So the topic of this lecture is one with which I have been wrestling for many years. The genesis of my attention to the role of culture in learning dates back to the late 1960s and early 70s at the beginning of the black power and black arts movements. This was a period in the United States when people of African descent here actively aligned with their African heritage as a source not only of group pride, but equally important as a catalyst for political organizing and institution building a pattern repeated across African American history. Across the country, young people such as myself engaged in bold acts of institution building. 
In Chicago, we developed, oh, this is also, this is my wedding. <laughs> this is my wedding and my naming, African naming ceremonies for my children. Um, <clears throat> in Chicago, we de developed Third World Press, which is today over 40 years old and the oldest continuous black publishing company in the United States. New Concept School, an independent African-centered school that is now nearly 40 years old and has now expanded into three African-centered charter schools that we've developed in Chicago over the last decade, the Betty Shabazz International Charter Schools and the Institute of Positive Education, an organization that focuses on social, cultural, and economic issues. Much to my mother's dismay, in 1974, I quit my job at Kennedy King College in Chicago to go work in a storefront with an emerging publishing company on one side and a startup school on the other. It was during that period that I met the man who would go on to become my husband, uh, and uh, writer and publisher, Haki Aramata Budi. My mother said she knew that this man had put the hoodoo on me. <laughs> And she literally asked her minister to help her find a psychiatrist to help me because she knew I had lost my mind. After directing and teaching in this African-centered school for 15 years, I decided to go back to work on a PhD at the University of Chicago. That transition shifted my focus from an examination of the cultural basis of learning inside practice to beginning to theorize this relationship between culture and learning in terms of the underlying mechanisms that help to explain how culture operates to both facilitate and constrain learning. Entering graduate school and eventually the professoriate with this long-standing interest in the role of culture, it became abundantly clear that the academy operated in a kind of intellectual apartheid. During this same period from the 1960s forward, there had been a growing shift from viewing cultural differences as deficits to a more liberal, multicultural orientation that viewed cultural differences often as distinct phenomena that could serve as positive resources for learning. There was also during this period an emerging attention to cross-cultural learning and development in psychology. Now classic studies by Michael Cole, Sylvia Scribner, Jean Lay, Barbara Rogoff, Patricia Greenfield, Jeffrey Sachs, Baritan D'Ambrosio, and others move past deficit theories to document the complexity of reasoning embedded in everyday practices. These studies took place outside of Europe and middle class America in Liberia, Mexico, Brazil, Guatemala, as well as blue collar workplaces, workplaces in the United States. This is also the period in which Western scholars, particularly in the United States, discovered the writings of Russian psychologist and socialist Lev Vygotsky, who made the compelling case on the role of social interactions and culturally organized activity as the cauldron of individual development. In addition, in the United States, the field of black psychology was also emerging. Black psychologists countered the prevailing deficit-oriented psychological theories about black development. The field of black psychology offered two important contributions to our evolving understanding of human learning and development. These contributions can be seen in research conducted by scholars such as Asa Hilliard, A. Wade Boykin, Wade Nobles, Sharshi McIntyre, Diana Slaughter Defoe, Harriet and John McAdoo, among others. The first was a move away from individualistic, purely person-oriented conceptions of identity and motivation to an ecological focus. Seminal works in the field argue for the need to understand the macro-level variables that structure roles and opportunities, as well as the broader context for which socialization in families and schools must prepare youth for all youth, and in particular ways for youth of color. These macro level variables include societal discrimination and stereotypes. A second contribution from the field of black psychology from seminal works has to do with, has been in understanding the ways in which cultural or racial or ethnic socialization can serve as a protective factor to influence positive development among youth of color. I argue here that this empirical work has also demonstrated how historical variables 
in this case as intergenerational beliefs and practices that together constitute a group identity operate to influence individual development. I point to this intellectual history first because these are the bodies of research that have most influenced me, but also to illustrate the intellectual apartheid to which I have referred. The cognitively oriented studies of how people learn are not in dialogue with those who focus on culture and cognition. The multiculturalists are not in dialogue with the culture and cognition research. Neither the cognitive oriented studies nor the world of human development have much to do with each other. I define dialogue here as joint studies, referencing in published, uh, res published research, especially handbooks and um, research syntheses. It is rare in the volumes from the National Research Council or the National Academy of Education to find any attempts to seriously synthesize across these paradigms an empirical basis to examine how culture operates to shape learning and development. While there are clearly differences among these paradigms, it is also evident that they share many fundamental propositions. The idea that context matters, that context help to shape people and people shape context, that routine practices in everyday life count, that the cognitive, social, physical, and biological dimensions of both individuals and context interact in important ways. Yet despite these broad points of convergence, as Michael Cole explains, we are not yet in a position to articulate a unified theory of culture and human development. Human development here includes not only the development of cognitive abilities, but equally the ways in which emotional and social development jointly with cognition shape goals, shape attention, shape persistence and resilience. We have an abundance of evidence, including our own tacit self-reflections, that learning is going to be influenced by intersections among thinking, perceptions of ourselves, perceptions of others, perceptions of tasks, emotional attributions, and self-regulation. We have an abundance of evidence that, when, <clears throat> that what some call this dynamic and complex system of the self is influenced by the context the routine practices in which we participate. And yet, we are still not able to use these fundamental propositions to understand the range of human adaptations to their environments in terms of the following. One is what such adaptations reveal about mechanisms that are local and situated and what such adaptations reveal about broader mechanisms that are universal in scope and essential to the species. I want to argue here that there are several underlying causes for the limited state of our knowledge of such complex dynamic ecological systems. First, the insistence in practice on isolating studies of cultural variation and patterns of learning and development from what is presumed the scientific study of learning and development a legacy from the persistent normative assumptions of white supremacy and class-based hegemony that today are largely tacit rather than explicitly public. Second, the intellectual isolation of core disciplines and paradigms within those disciplines, cognitive psychology from cultural psychology, cognitive psychology from relevant fields of human development, including the study of identity, personality, emotional development, motivation, attribution theory, social psychology, psychology, social cognition, and from the field of neuroscience, as neuroscientists are now examining the physiology of the brain to understand how people learn. So in this talk, I want to, un I want to explore what such disciplinary collaborations and active interrogation of these tacit assumptions about normative development may offer the field of education. That is, how attention to the centrality of culture may lead to a more robust understanding of human learning and development. So let me return to a personal story that sheds light on this intellectual journey of mine. About four years ago, I discovered that I had developed a macular hole in my left eye. Prior to that, I had never heard of macular degeneration. 
I had been traveling in London and found that I could not read the fine print of the train schedules without a magnifying glass. And in the usual and unfortunate habit of attending to my own health after the fact, I finally went to the ophthalmologist. After the initial exam, where my eyes were dilated, I bravely tried to drive myself home, and with my usual type A personality proclivities, I stopped off at the grocery store. <laughs> I found, of course, that I could not read the signs, but I did discover that what I would consciously use cues from the environment and my prior knowledge to piece together inferences about what I was seeing. Several years ago at a meeting at the National Science Foundation, a scholar from a center at the University of Wisconsin at Madison discussed a device being developed that would help blind people see through electrode stimulation on their tongues. As I reflected later, this reinforced a very essential proposition about the human species, and indeed all living organisms that survive evolutionary time. The ability to be adaptive is the key to survival. In the case of the tongue stimulating system, it is the fact that our brains do not depend on any single pathway for navigating the world. Here it means that the topic Excuse me, here it means that the optic nerve from our eyes is not the only pathway through which to stimulate the parts of the brain that interpret visual stimuli. We understand this kind of redundancy in the physiological system of humans from everyday experience as well. We know that blind people develop heightened sensations of sound and touch, that the deaf develop heightened attention to visual cues, if there is such built-in redundancy at the physiological level, there is every reason to believe that redundancy at the psychological level likely supports human adaptation in the social and cognitive domains as well. Here I define redundancy in terms of the potential functionality of multiple pathways for helping humans pursue cognitive and social goals for accomplishing things in the world, including accomplishing academic goals in the context of schooling. And yet, our prototypical response to the challenges of academic achievement is to articulate singular and normative pathways through which youth are able to navigate the waters of the academic disciplines. And by extension, the pathways through which teachers as adults may learn the complex and situated demands of teaching. So in this talk, I want to um, accomplish the following. One, I want to discuss warrants for why attention to diversity can contribute to the scientific study of human learning and development. Secondly, to provide some examples of research that document public pathways, for, excuse me, that document multiple pathways for learning and development and what new general propositions we can glean from what have traditionally been viewed as localized studies of the other. Then to discuss some conceptual implications, some policy implications, and some implications for practice. So here I want to explore the scientific basis for why attention to diversity in human learning and development is necessary to the articulation of robust and generative theories and by extension, the application of such robust and generative theories to problems of practice. I will make this case based on two sources of evidence. First, how humans evolved to be adaptive. And second, evidence of an integrated and dynamic psychological self in the human species. So my first warrant has to, uh, deals with this notion of the adaptability in human evolution. The basic argument I want to make here is that one premise we learn from our evolutionary history as a species and from other plants and animals is that the ability to adapt to changing circumstances is important. If we then accept that premise, it follows that understanding the underlying mechanisms that support adaptability should be important. Cultural diversity, I argue, is evidence of the adaptive systems developed across human societies in order to exist, to replicate ourselves, and to adapt to changing circumstances. 
I should first take note that I take this argument primarily from a wonderful synthesis of brain research in the book Liars, Lovers, and Heroes, What the New Brain Science Reveals About How We Become Who We Are by Stephen Quartz <coughs> and Terence uh, Chesnowski. I do not in any way pretend to have any level of expertise in this area, but find that the evidence from neuroscience and human evolutionary history a compelling warrant for why attention to diversity in the science of learning is crucial. Over human history, <coughs> In human evolutionary history, the physical environment of the earth has undergone significant shifts. The structure of our brain seems over evolutionary history to have developed built-in or hardwired capacities to read patterns and to impose meaning and to revise the meaning of those patterns based on how we learn from feedback on the consequences of our actions. As a species, we are disposed to pay particular attention to trying to read the internal states and goals of other humans. As Quartz and Szejnowski note, the human brain's expansion does not signify the accumulation of more and more instinctual behaviors, but rather a growing mental flexibility that expands our behavioral repertoire a flexibility that lies at the core of who we are. It is our ability to learn from others in socially organized groups that we are able to pass on behaviors across generations. But it is equally important that our biology makes the sense-making process not one of built-in and inflexible behaviors, but of the capacity to create meaning and to be self-reflective. Again, to quote from Quartz and Szejnowski, your biology has primed you to acquire a culture. It has endowed you with an internal guidance system that propels you from within and bootstraps you into culture by making the social world highly significant and fueling your desire to participate in it. One important trigger for brain activity is the release of the chemicals serotonin and dopamine. The serotonin system is found in the brain stem, which is among the oldest parts of our brain system. Again, to quote from Quartz and Szejnowski, one popular way to think of the release of serotonin at nerve terminals is as, a garden, is as garden hoses that have small holes punched all along their length. These hoses sprinkle your brain with serotonin which doesn't so much give cells their marching orders as change what they're already doing. Serotonin signals emotional reaction and dopamine influences our experiences of pleasure. There are several propositions that I take away from this brief, albeit simplified, description of brain chemistry and human evolution. The first is that we are hardwired to be adaptive, but it is the experience of human culture ultimately in all of its variation, that shapes both how such adaptiveness develops and to what we as groups and individuals learn to adapt. The second is that emotion and cognition are intimately and dynamically intertwined. I should note here that it is also, there is also an abundance of laboratory-based studies that also document the importance of emotion to cognition and motivation. The third is that it is our perception of other people and activities that matter. Thus, adaptiveness is the consequence of our efforts to make sense of other people and activity, which in turn result in our perceptions, which then serve as a central guidepost for how we as humans navigate in the world. I take this proposition as rooted in human evolutionary history and in the findings of neuroscience with regard to how our brains operate. These implications support the idea that culture, the medium through which intergenerational resources are passed on, as well as the medium through which novel constructions occur, must be important to understand and to acknowledge in this argument that culture and human biology are intimately intertwined. I now move to discuss 
what I think is another warrant for this same broad set of propositions. Here I seek to integrate studies of human cognition with studies of human developmental processes, which I think, when taken together, support the same findings I've noted from the brain science and human evolution perspectives. However, the integration of these two bodies of research, I think, introduces another important dimension that the first argument does not account for. That is, how power relations within and across cultural communities must also be taken into account if we are to articulate an integrated, robust, generative set of theories of human learning and development. In this argument, I'm most deeply indebted to Professor Margaret Veal Spencer of the University of Pennsylvania, whose work I will describe, and more recently the work of Professor Nyla Nazir at Stanford University. Broadly speaking, we can think of cognition as thinking and problem solving. In terms of the work of schools, we typically think of cognition as the knowledge required to solve problems in the academic domains. While clearly we as humans solve problems in virtually every aspect of our daily lives, I want to focus primarily here on learning in the academic domains because people are already fairly good at everyday problem solving. But as a field, as a profession, as a research society, we have a long way to go with regard to our understanding of academic learning in the disciplines, especially with regard to youth from racial and ethnic minority communities, youth from low economic resource communities, youth whose first language is other than English, and youth with disabilities. Even for learning in schools, cognition includes not only knowledge of tasks, in this case academic tasks, but also knowledge of one's self, settings, and others. Knowledge of self involves one's identity, or we might say identities, as members of families, of peer social networks, and larger communities, including those defined by ethnicity, race, nationality, and gender. Identity as a learner, and a learner of particular subjects. And for our purposes, how one identifies with the culture of a classroom and a school. One's construal of the self serves as an important guidepost for a range of affiliations that one seeks and works to sustain. The self is connected with the ego such that we seek experiences that support ego development, not necessarily in terms of a purely individualistic conception of a self, but rather as a psychological state that is affirming in which basic human needs are met. Maslow defines a hierarchy of human needs that range from a sense of safety, a sense of love and belonging, a sense of competency, self-esteem, and self-actualization. While there is no question that how these needs are manifested will differ across cultural communities, <coughs> I also have no doubt that in the broad sense they are basic to human psychological functioning. From a human development perspective, the goals that we set, our efforts to persist to accomplish goals, especially in the face of challenge, are influenced by our motivation, our attachments to people, our sense of ability as fixed or malleable, <clears throat> our conception of the task as interesting, as doable, as relevant, and weighed against competing goals, and our perceptions of the people with whom we interact in order to accomplish that goal. From a cognitive perspective, our ability to learn to accomplish the goals we set, especially in terms of academic learning, is influenced by the nature of the supports or scaffolds that are available to us to learn to do the task in question and the structure of the prior knowledge that we bring to the table. The complementary questions from a human development perspective are, do we feel safe in carrying out this work? How does engagement with this task weigh out in terms of competing needs? Do we develop a sense of competence as we move forward? And are the people with whom we are working as peers or teachers aiming to help us or to hurt us? It is not the case that all of these needs must be met in order for us to be successful, for example, in learning in school. But it is clear that some of these needs must be met and that there must be some form of support that helps us make sense of those aspects of the activity that do not meet our perceived and basic needs. 
For example, students who have clear long-term objectives to enroll in college may persist in classes in which they are bored and don't even feel particularly successful because the long-term excuse me, the long-term need for efficacy represented by college enrollment gives them a reason to persist. It is also crucial to note the developmental nature of these basic needs in learning transactions. For example, the needs of young children for competence and social connectedness are qualitatively different from those of adolescents. Thus, any integrated theory must have a developmental focus. It is equally crucial to my argument to assert that these developmental needs differ by cultural communities. So, for example, if we use Marcus and Kitayama's descriptions of individualist versus interdependent cultural communities, we would expect that a sense of social relatedness would look different when an adolescent grows up in a cultural community in which becoming an adult is marked by separation from one's family of origin versus when an adolescent grows up in a cultural community in which becoming an adult is marked by assumption of greater responsibilities as one further incorporates oneself into one's family of origin. The picture, however, is much more complex, uh, but I'll say more about that later. So I've tried so far in a very condensed way to capture what I think are propositions that are well established in the learning sciences, human development, social psychology, and black psychology. The problem, however, is that it is rare to find studies, especially studies of any scale, or educational interventions in schools and communities that actually operate theoretically from an integrated model that is informed by these propositions. Such an integrated model that is a model that incorporates both a cognitive as well as a psychosocial perspective of necessity requires the idea of multiple pathways. This is to say that, a, that either a purely cognitive approach focusing on the structure of knowledge to be learned or a purely psychosocial approach focusing on supports for a sense of emotional well-being are insufficient in and of themselves to develop learning that is robust, especially in the academic concept, context. So to summarize, I return briefly to my focus on adaptiveness as the key to human survival. By adaptiveness, I mean the ability to respond to changing circumstances in ways that sustain a sense of psychological and physical well-being. I have argued so far that the biology of our brains that in terms of the chemistry behind our emotions, the hard wires that focus our attention on people, our, curi our capacity to be self-reflective, as well as our dependence on cultural or social communities, both to develop from childhood into adulthood and to sustain communities over time. And the primacy of sense-making efforts would appear to be the tools available to us to be adaptive. And I've argued from the perspective of the learning sciences, human development, and social psychology that our sense-making entails cognition, emotion, and perceptions always working in tandem. I do not think that there's much controversy about these claims, even if we do not see them integrated in either the practice of research or the practice of schooling. However, there's another important elephant in the room about which we have less consensus and that serves as the conceptual filter through which we take, <clears throat> excuse me, take any of these propositions as a basis for the design of our research or our practice. This elephant in the room has to do with our conceptions of culture and cultural membership and how our understanding of culture and cultural membership informs how we think about cognition, emotion, and perceptions as these are brought to bear in, the, in learning transactions, particularly in terms of schooling. <clears throat> the United States is born out of a mixed history. On the one side, the revolution to establish a democratic society was a noble experiment. In particular, the articulation of the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution of the, excuse me, of the fundamental right of human beings to live free and to be able to exercise their individual rights as long as such exercise does not infringe on the fundamental rights of others continues to serve as an anchor for democratic debate 
and without question represents one of the finest social experiments in human history. At the same time, however, we cannot ignore the tragic contradictions that were in play during the actual formation of these foundational documents. Africans in the United States were legally considered three-fifths of a human being. Women could not vote. Those who did not own property could not vote. Indentured servitude was legal, as was slavery. The issue which we have had the greatest difficulty handling historically is the fact that this democracy was born on the backs of at least two human holocausts. The African holocaust of enslavement and the destruction of the indigenous nations in the Americas through war, outright murder, broken treaties, and the conscientious dismantling of families. Both holocausts were sanctioned on the basis of beliefs about what it means to be human and civilized, informed by assumptions of white supremacy and long-standing class biases that also were the legacy of much of the political and cultural history of Western Europe. For the first 400 years of what we might loosely call U.S. history, from the original settlement of Jamestown around 1619 to the historic Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision in 1954 and the subsequent Voting Rights Act of 1965, the attribution of whiteness and middle classness as normative served to justify all forms of discrimination against those who were excluded from this category. But it's interesting to note that who has been officially considered white has shifted over the years. Those of African, Hispanic, Asian, and American Indian descent have generally been deemed non-white, although Hispanics have historically <clears throat> been deemed white by courts to evade desegregating schools. Whiteness has been the basis for the sordid constructions of race. The very construct itself is so bizarre that up until the 19th century, Africans in America, for example, were defined on the basis of blood percentages, the so-called quadroons and octagons, determined by what percent of one's lineage was black. But interestingly, during periods of high immigration early in the 20th century, the Irish, Italians, and Eastern Europeans, including Jewish people, were considered non-white. Particularly for people of African descent, the focus on racial classification has thwarted attention to what it means to live culturally, to live as a person of African descent in the United States, that is to consider the question of ethnicity. From a sociological perspective, the identity questions with regard to race, ethnicity, and nationality, or for that matter, gender or disability, require a careful analysis. A reason to focus on race is because with ascribed racial classification comes exposure to institutional biases, prevalent cultural stereotypes, and outright persistent intergenerational discrimination. Thus, to ignore race is to take our vision away from the ways in which our society institutionalizes challenges to particular groups of people. To focus on nationality alone shifts our attention away from the multi-ethnic nature of U.S. society and increasingly more nation states around the world. And it should be noted that the United States has always been a multi-ethnic society. Globally, we see the presence of ethnic identification in the wars in Serbia, in Rwanda, and Kenya, the plight of the Roma, known as the Gypsies, historically across Europe, in Somalia, and in the political tensions across multiple ethnic groups indigenous to China. We see ethnic identification in both similarities and differences among black populations within the United States, between Caribbean Africans, immigrants from the continent of Africa, and those who are the descendants of the Africans originally enslaved in this country. To focus on ethnicity, allows us to consider the impact of how people live, what they do as routine practices, and the consequences of such routine practices for their development. It is important to note that I am not arguing that attention to race and nationality are not important. Indeed, I have already stated that attention to race is crucial, but, but we must understand for what ends. 
Attention to nationality is important also, particularly for international comparisons. But I would argue that in order for national trends to account for what is inevitably going to be variation, for example, in educational outcomes, nationality should also include attention to ethnicity and class within national borders. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to explore how we think about ethnicity as a lens for understanding the range of variation in pathways to learning and its attendant psychosocial development. Research focus on, on ethnicity and learning or ethnicity and psychosocial development typically tries to address some set of negative outcomes for marginalized youth. <clears throat> learning outcomes explained by stereotype threat, what are posited as non-canonical practices in families, such as parents who don't read books to their children at home, lack of mastery of academic English as a constraint on learning, lack of motivation, fear of acting white. There are two implicit assumptions underlying much of this research. The first is that normative problems of developing humans do not apply to ethnic minorities or the poor. You see this in a review of the standard handbooks on learning and on development. At best, there may be a single chapter devoted specifically to the problems of ethnic minority youth. And in the standard chapters on the big ideas in the field, there is virtually no mention of ethnicity or class diversity. The implicit assumption is that there are systematic studies of core constructs, such as conceptual change or attachment theory, but that their application and validity with regard to ethnic minorities need not be examined. The second implicit assumption, especially with regard to the learning side of the equation, is that the domains of everyday knowledge and disciplinary knowledge are either worlds apart, or if there are connections, such as in the work on the role of prior knowledge, naive concepts, and misconceptions, the everyday side of the equation is the deficit calculation. The fundamental premise of this talk is that we cannot articulate a generative and robust science of learning and development without explicit attention to the diversity of the human experience. The National Science Foundation and the Institute of Education Sciences, the two largest sources of federal funding for educational research, both explicitly call for attention to diversity in their RFPs. However, there are no common criteria, or for that matter, even idiosyncratic criteria, for what constitutes rigor with regard to issues of diversity in the conduct of educational research. There are no definitive syntheses of the existing research, nor comprehensive articulation of the many unanswered questions which attention to diversity might address. And thus, the most typical response to the criteria for diversity uh, in programs of research is either outreach activities aimed at underrepresented minorities that are not linked in any way to the fundamental research activity, or the focus is on attention to helping the colored people and the poor without any expectation that the findings from the research might contribute to the expansion of fundamental knowledge about human learning and development. These tensions then between what has been termed an etic versus an emic uh, perspective has a long history in anthropology and cross-cultural psychology. With greater attention to cultural diversity in psychological, developmental, and educational research, this tension is reflected in the following questions. When <clears throat> we study culturally distinct communities of practice, what can we understand that is unique to that community and that reflects the inside perspective of its members? And secondly, what can we understand that can be extrapolated across cultural communities? I think both questions are crucial and that we cannot address the second without addressing the first. That is, attention to the meaning of cultural practices within particular communities is crucial so that we are not imposing normative assumptions that have no meaning for the people we're studying. We have a very long history of making this mistake. At the same time, we need some ways of synthesizing across studies of culturally distinct communities in order to build generative theories about how we as humans learn and develop over time. So in order 
to move forward, there are some core propositions that I think we must address. The first one, cultural membership is based on shared routine practices and beliefs that are transmitted across generations, including across time and space. This is the reason we see the maintenance of practices and beliefs even when people immigrate to new nations and live in their adopted nations across several generations. So we see this in the St. Patrick's Day, from the people who've never been to Ireland. <laughs> Second, people can and do live in multiple cultural communities of practice, but the meanings and functions of these different cultural communities will differ. Often, although not always, the sense of identity associated with ethnicity as it is embodied in the practices of the family in which one grows up will serve as an important psychological anchor for the developing person. Cultural communities are communities precisely because of what they share. But at the same time, there is always significant variation within communities. Thus, we need what my friend Professor Chris Gutierrez at UCLA calls a binocular vision. With one lens focused on what makes communities culturally distinct, and a second lens focused on the variation within communities. Understanding variation is very important and I would argue is fundamental to the question I raised at the beginning of this talk about how adaptation is the key to human survival. I would argue that it is understanding human adaptation to our social, political, economic, and biological ecologies that is central to the scientific study of human learning and development. And thus that, <clears throat> excuse me, human diversity as captured within and across cultural communities as well as individual variation within such communities is the science we want and need to understand. The process through which humans learn in and from their environments and how they learn to adapt to those environments always entails risk and support. Here I draw explicitly from the work of Margaret Bill Spencer's research and her PBEST model. Professor Spencer argues that to be human is to be placed at risk. While on the surface this may seem obvious, if one examines the research literature in education, human development, and the learning sciences, one leaves with the impression that it is the youth of color and the poor who have the problems, and that middle class and upper class white youth are somehow immune from risk. And the picture there is a picture from the shooting at Columbine. For example, our term at-risk youth is intended as a synonym for youth of color and youth from economically poor communities. Thus, understanding the nature of risk faced by individuals and communities, how people actually experience those risks, and the nature of the supports that are or are not available to them, as Professor Spencer argues, <clears throat> is necessary for understanding the range of human variation in developmental pathways. Spencer asserts that the nature of challenges and needed supports will change based on age. So for example, the needs of a young child for a sense of competence and attachment are going to be qualitatively different from those of an adolescent. Spencer's final and perhaps most compelling point is that youth who face persistent challenges based on race, ethnicity, poverty, immigrant status, etc., must learn to cope with both the normative challenges of growing up as well as the specialized challenges of stigmatization. This means that ethnic and racial socialization, for example, can serve as important and necessary supports for holistic development. Let me be very clear. I am not arguing that these propositions should inform research on culturally diverse populations, which by the way is our acronym for what we ascribe to be non-white groups. Rather, I am arguing 
that programs of research that seek to examine or generate fundamental theories about how and what humans learn and the attendant psychosocial processes entailed in such learning need to consider these propositions when thinking about the very questions being raised, how they sample, what kinds of data are collected, the validity of instruments used, and the assumptions underlying variables articulated, as well as the potential limitations of their findings. To reiterate, I seek in this talk to argue that in order to generate robust and generative theories about how and what people learn, we must attend to issues of diversity based on conceptually complex frameworks that position diversity as the human experience and not some wayward pathology. I will try in this final section of the talk to illustrate several programs of research that have focused on black and brown populations and have articulated insights about human learning and development that are generative, that is, they have application and meaning across cultural communities without being normative. I will illustrate three programs of research, although there are many fine long-term programs of research that I could use. Naila Nazir's research on non-school settings, the work of Doug Medine and Megan Bang among the Menominee, and finally my own work in cultural modeling. Here we have a scholar who situates her research within the African American community and seeks to examine a set of fundamental propositions about what makes a learning community robust. It is precisely because Professor Nazir examines settings and populations where the dual challenges of normative development as well as racial, ethnic, and class identities are clearly at work that she's been able to contribute to our understanding of both the conditions under which transfer may be maximized, as well as our understanding of fundamental features of robust learning environments. Naila Nazir has examined two routine practices with cohorts of African American youth, playing dominoes and playing basketball. For each of these domains, like Margaret Spencer, she has taken an explicitly developmental focus by examining youth at different ages with different levels of expertise. She has documented the computational skills as well as the development of strategic planning processes in child, adolescent, and adult domino players. She has documented the knowledge of simple statistics among basketball players, many of whom do not transfer their mathematical competencies in basketball on the courts to, the math, math, excuse me, to their mathematical classes uh, in school. She has also examined the structure of scaffolding in an after-school track team. All of these are out-of-school environments in which youth learn complex skills. She contrasts the more expansive view of how people learn that characterizes these settings with the more restrictive view of learning in schools. Among the notable findings of Professor Nazir's research are the following. One, the importance of making problem-solving strategies explicit and public. Second, the importance of timely feedback on performance. Third, the importance of positioning learners as competent. And fourth, the importance of social relationships between teachers and learners and among peers. And how these practices play out is not generic. Rather, they are responsive to the cultural histories of the communities in which youth live. These practices are intended to help these youngsters understand the challenges they face and to provide them with repertoires for coping with challenge and for excelling in the face of adversity. They are not generic strategies that can simply be imported anywhere, but rather they require that those who are either designing and or teaching understand their students as individuals, as members of families, and as members of historical communities. As with the PBES model of Margaret Beale Spencer, Professor Nazir's research seeks to articulate adaptive principles that are responsive to local conditions and local histories, but at the underlying principles, I would argue, are generative. The second program of research is that carried out by Douglas Medine of Northwestern University and Megan Bang of Turk. Professor Medine has worked for over a decade 
with the Menominee Nation in Wisconsin. Megan Bang is Ojibwe and an outstanding young American Indian scholar, who I believe is in the room here. Raise your hand, Megan, where are you? They can't see you, stand up. <laughs> okay. Nadine has documented the prevalence of ecological reasoning about the natural environment among the Menominee. The Menominee are known for rich ecological practices with regard to sustainable forestry practices and maintaining a balance within the wildlife of that area. Medina and Bang argue that the prevalence of ecological reasoning among the Menominee can be traced in part to intergenerational practices involving fishing. While nearby European Americans also routinely fish, the two communities impute very different cultural meanings to the practice. And Menominee who live in Chicago, for example, still maintain ecological beliefs about the natural world, largely through social ties and traditional belief systems. In a recent study, Bang and Medine have tested a prevalent theory in cognition that children's conceptions of the natural world are anthropocentric, meaning they project human attributes onto animals, rather than vice versa. Medine and Bang found out, and I quote, Rural children, both Menominee and rural European American, generalize more from wolf to other animals than from humans to other animals. This suggests that reasoning about the natural world is predicated on children's experiences with the natural world rather than a universal pattern. However, they found that Menominee children are much more likely to justify their claims on the basis of ecological relations. For example, to, and I quote from them, justify generalizing from bees to bears because a bee might sting a bear or a bear might acquire the property of eating the bee's honey. They argue that the genesis of these beliefs may likely be the Menominee creation story in which humans evolved from the bear and the prevalence of an animal-based clan system. The research not only has implications for teaching about ecology in ways that are anchored in the routine practices and belief systems of cultural groups, but is equally important in framing how we go about studying the development and genesis of children's knowledge about the natural world. I want to conclude with a very brief discussion of my own work in cultural modeling. I need to abbreviate the discussion of my work in cultural modeling. And as with previous programs of research, I have documented the genesis of disciplinary reasoning in the everyday practices of black and brown youth. Specifically, I have shown the um, specifically I have shown the prevalence of literary reasoning <clears throat> embedded in signifying among speakers of African American English and how the structure of that reasoning is related to the demands of reasoning about literary text. That work has also led me to re-examine some fundamental assumptions about what novices need to know in order to learn and analyze canonical literary texts. The idea that there are classic types of problems, generative relations among types of problems, strategies, heuristics, and dispositions or habits of mind have been central to mathematics and science education, but not to the teaching of literature. I discussed these ideas uh, in my most recent book, Advertisement, Advertisement, uh, Cultural Literacy and Learning Taking Bloom in the Midst of the Whirlwind, published by Teachers College Press and available in the book exhibit. A third insight that I gleaned from my work is that robust learning environments provide what I call multiple culturally rich contextualization cues that signal to novices what roles are available and sanctioned for us to play, who can talk about what and how, what tasks we are expected to engage in and how. Again, we revisit the idea of redundancies and multiple pathways. This means that the role transition for students is made easier, especially for students with long histories of underachievement in school, for whom the longer they remain in school, the more skeptical of the whole enterprise they become. Such cues, I would argue, include the following. 
Everyday knowledge embedded in routine practices in which the youth engage directly themselves is invited as an object of inquiry <clears throat> and a scaffold to related disciplinary knowledge. This is what we have done in the domain of literature. It is also what Bob Moses' has, uh, algebra project has done with the teaching of fundamental algebraic constructs based initially on analogies of traveling along an urban transit system. It is what the, <clears throat> the researchers at Shea Shea Cone and at Turk with Beth Warren, Ann Roseberry, Josiane uh, Hudicord Barnes have documented with the use of Haitian Creole argument structure in science classrooms. It's what Arnitha Ball has documented with regard to preferences and expository writing of an African-American adolescent speakers of African-American English. And I could go on, but you see the point. Secondly, ways of speaking in classrooms that privilege language resources that students bring from their everyday linguistic practices and repertoires outside of school create opportunities for participation and the assumption of meaningful roles in the problem solving and inquiry work of classrooms. We have documented this with fascinating range of rhetorical moves as the vehicles for conveying deep thought among the African American English speakers in our studies. We have similar findings about bilingual language resources in the work of Marjorie Oriana, Guadalupe Valtes, Olga Vasquez, Maria Frankis, and others. I'm arguing that these studies do not represent isolated, self-interested investigations of colored people, cute multicultural meanderings from the real questions of learning. Rather, I am arguing that they provide the kinds of rich contextual information about the circumstances under which learning new stuff is maximized, that the conditions under which adaptability is maximized. And I also want to add that the underlying assumption behind the anchoring of school-based instruction on what kids know and value is not an end goal unto itself. Rather, the goal of learning to be adaptive to develop what the late Giyu Hatano and Ran Spiro have called adaptive expertise, is to build transitions to that which you don't know. Such work inevitably requires what Chris Gutierrez of UCLA calls hybridity. These new learning environments will provide the intermingling, the interanimation, if you will, of multiple languages, such as African American English and academic English, of Spanish and the English of mathematics, multiple worldviews, the ecological orientation of the menominee and the ecological orientation of the sciences, multiple ways of reasoning, reasoning about rap lyrics and reasoning about canonical literary texts, multiple role playing, students assuming the role of teachers and teachers assuming the roles of learners within classrooms. Professor Gutierrez argues that it is explicitly this attention to hybridity that is the fulcrum for creativity, the medium that provides opportunities for new constructions that neither teachers nor students could anticipate ahead of time and thus makes for the most exciting and generative kinds of teaching and learning. I think this is, yeah. So in conclusion, for real, we face challenges in the field of education. These challenges are highlighted by the overwhelming evidence of inequity in educational outcomes and opportunity to learn. There is an underlying hope that educational research can provide our society with the intellectual tools for addressing these pressing problems through the generation of theories that are sufficiently robust to be responsive to the wide variation of life circumstances of youth and families and of institutional resources available to them. If what emerges from us as a field are pronouncements like, if parents don't read books to their children before they come to school, the children are not likely to become competent readers. If parents don't engage in the kind of talk that we imaginatively think goes on in middle class homes, the children's vocabulary will be so limited that they can never catch up. If the children haven't learned the alphabetic principle and how to count to 10 before they reach kindergarten, they'll be behind forever. If the children don't speak the king's English, they cannot be taught. If the parents don't come to school, they're not interested in their children's education. At best, such pronouncements first are based on studies of white middle class samples. But at worst, they reflect our stereotypes about poor people and their children. 
Second, these folk beliefs presume a monolithic approach to teaching that does not create multiple pathways for reaching common goals. I ask, what are the most foundational principles about learning that can help inform practice, whether it takes place on the reservation of the Menominee Nation in Wisconsin, in a Los Angeles classroom with children from families who are recent immigrants from seven different countries of origin, in the Appalachian Mountains with white families who have lived in persistent intergenerational poverty, in a New York City classroom where blacks who are uh, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Brazilian, Senegalese, Eritrean, and descendants of the, Af descendants of the Africans who were enslaved, or for that matter, in classrooms in the <clears throat> rich, predominantly white suburb of Skokie, near Northwestern, where I teach, whose high levels of academic achievement, as measured by the state assessments, mask the NAEP trends that show in reading and in mathematics that less than 10% of U.S. 17-year-olds are able to engage in the most complex problem-solving tasks. I want to see our field generate theories of learning that take into account all this complexity that helps us understand the cognitive, social, and emotional dimensions of learning and the ways in which identity is linked to goal setting and persistence and the ways in which competence is very much context dependent. I want us to generate theories of learning that help us understand how practices involved in the exercise of power and the availability of resources can impact opportunity to learn, including how socialization efforts can lead to ways that youth can learn to make sense of and resist those institutional structures and practices that constrain their opportunities to learn. This kind of understanding, I think, is the essence of learning to be adaptive. And learning to be adaptive is indeed the name of the game called life. Thank you. It was so long, I kept cutting and cutting. Recall Phyllis Wheatley wrote, Imagination, who can sing thy force? Imagination, who can sing thy force? Imagination, who can sing thy force? Imagine. Who will pull us out of intellectual apartheid? She did. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was awesome. And I, I don't believe there was any need to apologize uh, about the time. Uh, we have ample time to take questions uh, per the guidelines set by William Tate, the president of the American Educational Association. Your questions should be succinct, and if you have a commentary, it should be under three or four sentences. Are there questions or comments under those guidelines? Adaptation, that's what we have to do. It might be best if you actually walk up and use the mic. We are taping this session. I think it's extremely important that we get your thinking about these ideas as well. <clears throat> yes. My name is Ebony McGee. I'm from the University of Illinois, Chicago. That was amazing and incorporated everything I had been thinking about over the past four years. I, my question is in relation to adaptiveness. Mm -hmm. Is that the same as resilience? And if it's different, could you just provide a more comprehensive definition of it? Thank you. Well, I think that 
Um, I, I wouldn't say that they're the same, but I think that they're related. Resilience typically refers to the ability to sort of come back after you've been knocked down. But I would argue that adaptiveness is what we do all of the time. I mean, you come into the room, the room is filled, and you've got to find a seat, and there's not a single pathway somebody's saying, go sit there. You, you, uh, you, know, you meet somebody new, and your adrenaline gets going, and you kind of like it, and you're trying to figure out. We are adapting all of the time. Every second of the day as human beings, we're adapting to new sets of circumstances. Um, uh, and so that's why I been attracted to this sort of evolutionary argument and the sort of biological, phys physiological basis for thinking about it, simply to say this, this is what we're hardwired to do. Hi, uh, my name is Samina Hadi Tabassum. My colleagues and I are having heated debates about the curriculum in schools of education and how perhaps there's a lack of a liberal arts foundation that we don't teach enough of history and philosophy and psychology and even science in the education field. And I'm wondering, um, is that one way to get at that lack of knowledge that many teacher education candidates are leaving with in terms of not knowing the histories of these communities, the culture, the psychology uh, behind um, education as a whole? Well, I, I think that one of the fundamental challenges that we, we face in terms of teacher education is a deep under-conceptualization of the complexity of what it means to be a teacher. And I think that, that teaching involves uh, a deep knowledge of many things. I think it involves a deep knowledge of the domain, obviously, of things that we're teaching. It becomes more complex at the elementary school level because the elementary school teacher then has to have deep knowledge of lots of different subjects that he or she is teaching. But I think it also requires a deep understanding of human development, what makes people tick, you know, this whole issue of people's perceptions. This is one of the things we don't really get. One of the fun, wonderful teachers that I work with that I do talk about in the book uh, this was Wilma Hayes, and she would say, she said, it's not what I intended to teach. She said, it's what the kids, what did they think was going on? So this ability to, uh, um, and to, to understand, this is one of the areas where Margaret Spencer's work has been so important for me. Of, a lot of times we have problems in schools with discipline sorts of issues. And one of the ways in, in terms of this developmental focus, we find, for example, particularly with African American and Latino, particularly males, that they are treated in schools when discipline issues come up as though they're little men, as opposed to the fact that they're children. And because they're children, it means that, the be, that, that understanding what's behind the behavior is going to be very different than if they were 25 or 45 years old. And their sort of social understanding of how they read the setting in other people is going to be different. So I think teachers have to have deep understanding of that. I think they also have to be intellectuals. I remember many years ago seeing on the front of uh, some magazine, I can't remember it was, in the Soviet Union, the idea the point was that at the first day of school that the children went to school with these little flowers in hand to give the teacher, with the sort of fundamental notion that a teacher is an intellectual. I mean, that's actually true in much of other parts of the world, particularly in Europe in, 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 uh, in Asian countries as well, as the notion that the teacher is fundamentally an intellectual. And as an intellectual, it means they're going to read widely about history, about culture, about politics, about all kinds of things. So I think the idea that you can learn all of this complexity by taking, and I agree they need more liberal arts courses and the like, <clears throat> but I, I do not believe that taking additional courses in and of its, I think it's necessary but not sufficient. And that the way that you learn this complex practice is in the context of practice. I, I asked uh, Lee Ping Ma, I'm sure many of you know her work, which he had, uh, had done this study of U.S. teachers, fifth grade, well, they were multiple classes, but the examples, fifth grade teachers in math and from the U.S. and from China. She gave them a problem. You have two unlike <coughs> fractions that you're dividing. <coughs> what are you doing? Why? All the Chinese teachers could do the proceed. You know, you change, the, take the second fraction, invert the numerator, denominator, change the sign from division to multiplication. <clears throat> all the Chinese teachers could do the solution. Most, although not all, the U.S. teachers could do the solution. 
Every Chinese teacher had a multiple mathematical explanation as to why, and not one um, U.S. teacher could explain why. So I asked Lee, I said, it must be something in the teacher training that, you know, caused it. She says, no, that's not really what it is. She said, she said, it's what happens after they get to the school. And that the, they, they enter into the school almost like we do medical internships, where there's a master who's right there with you all along the way helping you to understand that. So I just think we need a fundamental, for me, that's the counterpart to what I was trying to accomplish in part in this talk <clears throat> is that uh, what I am convinced is that as a field, all the fields we sort of represented within AERA, let's say, that the questions having to do with diversity, we think don't have to do with science. So if you want to know the science of the stuff, you do one thing. And if you want to do good in the world, then you'd be multicultural and helpful and whatever all that stuff is. And we don't think we don't have this fundamental conception that you can't understand the science if you don't understand the diversity. And I think we have the same kind of fundamental conceptual problem uh, in our conceptualization about teaching. And that's why I put on the end of the title of the talk, in the spirit of the theme for the conference, is that one of the reasons, and I'm not remotely arguing it's the only reason, but one of the reasons <clears throat> that in the field of education, we have so little impact on practice is because the fundamental theories from which we operate are not sufficiently robust to do the job. And they're not sufficiently robust to do the job because we don't want to account for the variation of the stuff that we see. If we see persistence and people resisting, there's a reason for it. And it isn't just some high, you know, whatever. There's, there are fundamental kind of issues about basic needs that we have because we are human beings. Professor King. I, too, want to congratulate you on a fantastic talk. Um, your presentation suggests reciprocity mm. in the role relationship between teachers and the classroom experience and the researcher and the arena mm -hmm. for the development of the fundamental knowledge. Could you talk about some of what you may have learned along the way from communities, from the students, you know, in your uh, process of inquiry? Um, my, my PhD is in education. It was interesting, um, sometimes in education we are viewed as the sort of stepchildren of, you know, if you really want to be a psychologist or something. Um, and I remember I was recently inducted to the National Academy of Education and that first, that cohort, everybody got up and said what their field was and they were coming to me and I was like, now what am I going, because nobody said they were in education because most of them weren't trained in education, interesting, clean up. Um, <laughs> but when, when I first did this work in cultural modeling and I went back in, in, into the, to actually teach in that, class, in that high school, and I had what was fundamentally a cognitive approach to thinking about how do I sort of decipher what novices need to know to deal with literature. And I had a cultural thing, orientation about, you know, but then when I got into this classroom, um, although many really powerful things happen, something as simple as one example in, in my class, and this little girl was mad every day. And so I finally took her to the side one day after class and I said, I just would like to understand what the problem is. Why are you so mad? Because I have not done anything to you. And she looked at me and she said, I'm not mad at you, I'm mad at my mama. She says that when I leave school, I have to go pick up, because she had a child, I had to go pick up my baby from the babysitter and go home. When I get home, and then my little brothers and sisters are there. My mother doesn't get home until late at night. I have to fix dinner. She said, my baby is bad. He won't go to sleep. And I can't get my homework done, and I'm mad. And then the light bulb went off and said, well, signifying doesn't answer that. 
the deep analysis of the literary text doesn't, ask, doesn't answer that. <laughs> what is it that I'm supposed to, how am I supposed to respond? And truthfully, what happened is the mama in me came out, and I gave her a mama response as to what it is she should do. And she came back in the next day, and she was smiling. And, and it's important from a developmental perspective, which is another piece that I learned. What it, it wasn't that I could give her a one-shot inoculation, say, this is what you do with your baby. She goes home tonight, it works. That doesn't mean it's going to work every day and it's just a linear path and she's going to jump up. But to realize that, that that path for her was an up and down path, up and down path. And, and because it was an up and down path, what I had to do was to learn how to dance with her. You know, sometimes I would follow her lead and sometimes she would follow my lead. And, and for me, it, that's what made teaching fundamentally interesting. Because there wasn't a prescription that somebody could give me, but it was constantly, how, how do I read this child? How do I presume that because she was not a psychopath, this is very serious. That's, to me, that's the Maslow argument. We are hardwired to want to feel balanced. Unless we are psych schizophrenic or something, which means there's typically some chemical thing going on, what we want, we want to be happy, we want to be competent, we want to feel balanced, right? And so, so I didn't come in thinking that way, but those kids would teach me these things. They were just very complex uh, 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 human beings. And the act of trying to study it and figuring out how to be re reciprocal in some sense with them, because I assume that's what I was there for. I wasn't there to be a receptive of there's some knowledge in my head and your job is to get it, and if you don't get it, you know, that's your problem. My job was to figure out how to dance with them. And, um, and, I, and I think that it is not only what is interesting, I think it's what is honorable and what is moral and what is inspiring about teaching. And it's fundamental, again, to the human thing. I have to keep coming back to this because, and really Joyce's work and Sylvia Winter's work has been very inspirational to me on this matter. And that is that we, are caught in a web of assumptions that grow out of a, a philosophy about white supremacy and about class. And everywhere you look, if you're living inside of the assumptions of that web, you are constantly responding to this. Oh, no, we're not like that. Oh, let me respond to this. Oh, let me respond to that. Oh, we got history, too. Oh, whatever. These are... But if you work, this is the Asa Hilliard response, if you get out of that web and you say, we are all human beings, we are all caught on this place called Earth, and we're all going to get stroked, and we're all going to get kicked. And the task of, is, of the science is to figure out how you understand how we respond and make sense of that stuff, because it's going to happen. And once you work, that's the fundamental claim, I'm a human being. And on the basis of being a human being, we have a whole different conversation than one in which I'm reacting to some set of, you know, some stuff you said. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have one more question. Well, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anna Stetsenko. I come from uh, Eastern Europe, this population which was considered lo not long ago non-white. I mm -hmm. think I, I know what it feels to be non-white. Mm -hmm. I feel myself non-white, mm -hmm. actually. <laughs> but what I want to say is that I think you do more than just adapt. You yourself, I think your work is transforming the world. Mm -hmm. I think people here in this audience have been transformed by your talk today and by your research and mm -hmm. others research such as Nasir's research mm -hmm. helps to transform the world. So I would question a little bit the adaptation only versus transforming, always changing the world, because adapting is something to the given. 
to, to something that's out there for you and mm -hmm. you cannot change it. And transforming is, yes, it has an element of adaptation, mm -hmm. but it's always about moving forward and changing, transforming. So transformation mm -hmm. versus adaptation, I would say you mm -hmm. are doing that mm -hmm. rather than just adapting. Well, Thank you. I think that's a very, actually a very powerful distinction that you're making, and it, it comes back again, um, I, I want to argue in part my response is influenced by um, a, a long collaboration we call CHILD, the Collaborative for the Study of Human Learning Development. Chris Gutierrez, Beth Warren, uh, Ann Roseberry, Margaret Spencer, Nyla Nazir, Anita Ball, a bunch of us have been working on this. Um, that the, the fascinating thing about culture is that it is not simply the replication of something from the past that just gets carried over and stays the same. And, it's, and that's been the fascinating thing for me of thinking about and, and reading this brain science of human evolutionary stuff is the notion that, that and, and it's, as I understand it, and there may be some neuroscience people here who can correct me because this is like not really in any way my area of expertise, but that the dopamine as I read about it, is this chemical that propels us toward novelty. And, the, and, and being propelled toward novelty, seeking novelty, I think is part of what fuels transformation as opposed to what might be considered a kind of passive adaptation to the circumstances are here and I'm just going to figure out how I fit in those circumstances. That might be one way of viewing adaptation. Transformation, I think, on the other hand, is saying, here's the circumstances are out here, but I have a new vision. And so I've got to change those circumstances. So I think that's a very powerful distinction. I appreciate it. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine <laughs> an intellectual merger that represents the very best in research and civic responsibility. She did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.